Hey guys, how are you guys doing? Yeah. All right, let's give it up. Like, uh, south of France, we couldn't ask for, like, we got some good weather today. Isn't this pretty awesome? Uh, and we're in the south of France, so uh, I couldn't be uh, more pleased about all that action. Uh, I'm excited to, like, uh, moderate this panel for you. I'm Allie, I'm your humble little moderator. And today we're going to be talking about are you brand experience, uh, uh, brands. We're going to be talking about how brands, branded content, how artists can approach brands, all the other good stuff in here. Um, I'm going to let my panelists introduce themselves, and and then we're going to just roll right into it. All right. And at the end, we'll open it up for some questions uh, and go from there. One, two, thank you. I'm Olivier Robert Murphy, uh, a French living in London. For 20 years, I'm global head of new business at Universal Music Group, meaning I match artists and brands globally. Hello, um, I'm Mathias Lelier. I'm deputy general manager of Live Nation France. I started uh, as an indie promoter, uh, then joined the Warner Group, and uh, since a year and a half, Live Nation. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Georgia. I'm an analyst at a company called Media Research. Um, I've just joined them very recently to set up a new marketing and media brands practice. Formerly, I was brand partnership director at Boiler Room. Uh, my name is Tej, um, based out of Bombay, India. I spent the last four years as the head of artist management at uh, OML, uh, which is the largest company, uh, management company in India. And uh, I left that last year, and uh, I now own my own business, which is artist management and uh, promotion. All right, awesome. I'd love to see who's in the room. How many artists are in the room? All right, awesome. And how many like managers? Um, let's see, what else do we got? Any attorneys in here? No. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Um, what do the rest of you guys do? Just shout it out really quick. Publisher. College. Stu students. How many students are in here? Woo! Look at you guys. All right, good for you. This is the best thing you can do: is come and learn, learn, learn about this. Um, I'm just going to go, since each company does something a little bit different, different than the other ones, I'm going to let them explain just for a few seconds here or a minute uh, what they, how they work with brands and, and artists as well. Um, so why don't you start? We'll start with you and tell me how you work with, how, how you guys work with brands. We work with brands. Um, it all starts with insights. You don't match any artist with any brands. The artist has passion points. Um, the brand wants certain things and it's not only the daughter of a CMO or CEO deciding what should be the artist. So it's all start with insight. We have today the tools to match the right artist to the right brand. Then it's about the idea, the creative, what would be the good idea and I will give example later. And finally you, you deliver it and you end with the what I call the KPI, the ROI, return on investment. Because if a brand pays money, they want to know why they're paying for. So that's how we work. Awesome. Um, so, but Live Nations, I have to go back to what we do. Basically, we're in the live music business. Uh, we operate across 40 countries, 128 festivals, 200 venues, etc. Um, and our domain of expertise are concerts, festivals, touring in general with promoters, producers, venue operations, um, of course booking, hospitality, food and beverage, merch, and ticketing with Ticketmaster. Uh, last year uh, did uh, 500 million tickets sold. So uh, um, all those operations um, consist in uh, this big, formidable, uh, global full services platform for the artist to connect with his fans and his audience and um, how brands can uh, play a role into into this connection uh, that's what our division at sponsorship partnerships but also our in-house agencies uh, work on with the brands and the artist uh, to enhance the actual uh, live experience um, so I'm going to speak a little bit with uh, the different hats on Boiler Room and Media. Um, firstly, Boiler Room's business model was all based around uh, brand sponsorships. So seven, year, um, seven years old company grew really, really fast and part of that was 
because of the partnerships that we were able to form with brands that opened up new territories to us and new artists and new spaces. It wouldn't have been possible without working for brands. Um, it was a really interesting place to play with this because it was kind of the time when brands were, um, I suppose partnerships were evolving from a sponsorship space into much more deep integrated campaigns um, and much more sort of uh, credible um, relationships between brands, artists, and platforms, void room being a platform, where, whereas previously you sort of had more simplistic relationships between artists and sponsors. Um, and then with regards to media, um, this new research practice that we're looking at, we're looking at kind of what new spaces that the digital economy is opening up for brands. So if you think about things like radio being in long-term decline um, and being replaced essentially by streaming, and streaming's both subscription and ad-supported tiers growing, suggesting there's going to be lots more um, new spaces opening up for brands that can think creatively about kind of the audio advertising space via streaming sites like Spotify. Um, so yeah, those sort of two little bits. Yeah, um, I, you know, being in India, uh, it's a really exciting time, uh, similar to what um, Georgia just mentioned, because, you know, there's no real guidelines, there's no real directive in terms of what you can do and what you, like, sort of can't do with a brand, so it, it leaves it very open, and uh, that's a really exciting position to be in, because it enables you to have a lot of different uh, avenues to work with that brand, so some of the ways that we've <clears throat> worked with brands before in the past are, of course, um, providing music for advertising and getting syncs. Uh, we've also done things like endorsement deals, um, getting deals from apparel brands like Adidas and Levi's, as well as doing things for brands like Red Bull, um, where, you know, playing for them on sponsored stages, um, all the way up to raising sponsorship for a large-scale festival or large-scale uh, tour or concert. So those are some of the ways that we've done it, and I'm sure we'll get into more detail over the rest of the discussion. Yeah, actually... Um you cut. You touched on a couple of things that I actually want to talk about. Um, and you coming from the live event space and doing stuff like that, I'd love to talk about, especially with you in another country. And you gave us some great information earlier today about how there's no, uh, you know, the the brand approach for artists and how that works in your country because there's no um, there's no publishers or things like that for syncing. So if there's an, an artist in India or artists. Uh, there, there's not a way for them to approach a brand again. They're commercial per se, unless they are kind of do it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a mixed uh, set of things, right? Because like you've got the the downside is that okay, you don't have publishers in the country, and so it's very hard to get somebody to represent your catalog and hence pitch to a brand on your behalf. But it's a really exciting thing because you know if you're a young independent artist and you've got a hit song that's bubbling. Uh, you know, organically without being pushed by radio or being pushed by um, any large scale sort of media support. Um, you know, if a brand hears about that, they say, oh, what's this really cool opportunity that maybe I can get on? And then they might take that and they might uh, start working with you in, in a very transactional relationship. So that's sort of how our uh, relationship with Adidas started. They, they liked a song that one of our DJ producers has, had made. And they ended up licensing that song. That very quickly led into um, them looking at the artist uh, in a much closer uh, um, light and sort of uh, saying, okay, what else can we do here? What, what's his audience like? And then um, basically going back to what uh, Olivier had mentioned, when they looked at all of the stats and they looked at all of the data and they looked at you know, who our audiences that we're talking to, they said, you know, this is a perfect fit um, in terms of what we're trying to achieve with our brand. So... Uh, that's how it sort of ended up tying up and then that ended up in an endorsement and then we started producing events for them and then, you know, five years down the line, we've got a very close relationship with Adidas uh, still. So that's an example of maybe how it can happen. But I think what you were um, referring to earlier uh, about sort of how India can work with certain brands and not other brands, there is a, 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 a law in India that alcohol and tobacco uh, companies cannot advertise through traditional advertising mediums. So you will never see a beer ad on television or on radio or uh, in a print, uh, in a magazine or in a newspaper. So, you know, where does that leave them? They, that means you've got multinational huge companies like uh, Pernod Ricard and Diageo and Bacardi, you know, who've got massive marketing uh, money to spend, but they're uh, legally not allowed to spend it in the avenues that they're used to spending it. So that means that they have to start uh, looking for other ways to spend their marketing money. And that will often result in sponsorship for 
um, live events. It will also uh, result in experiential marketing, doing something with an artist and so on and so forth. So um, to, for us as uh, promoters and as artist managers uh, in India, that has actually really helped us uh, substantially. You know, um, the law and the fact that they can't spend their money traditionally has freed up a lot of money, f which has underwritten our live music uh, sector in India. Yeah, uh, and one of the things, since we're already touching on this with Sync in endorsements and sponsorships, is one of the things we might as well just get out of the way earlier is how can, how can an artist approach a brand? And how do, they, how do they determine whether it's a good fit? How does the brand determine whether the artist is a good fit? Uh, we, had, we had many examples uh, in, in, that we talked about earlier today, and I'd love to just touch on some of those things for many of the artists that are out here and, and, and managers and all the other publishers that have artists how can they approach that brand and, 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 and work with them? What is, what is the value? What does each one bring in value? Um, I can talk about the live events for sure. Um, because we all know here that live music is now the number one passion now for Generation Z, Millennials, call, call them what you want. Um, and it's actually the top form of entertainment now for Millennials. So. Uh, how uh, an artist who delivers those shows, those incredible, unforgettable experiences, can integrate a brand, uh, how a brand can play a key role in this experience uh, and benefit from it. Um, it's all about enhancing the experience um, because uh, as a pro promoter with the artist, we deliver the live event for the fans, for the audience. Then with the artist, we give a brand the opportunity to uh, to enhance this experience, whether it's VIP treatment, it's additional content, it's hospitality, even basic things like providing info, help uh, you know the, the event go smoothly, that kind of things you can find on, uh, on concerts, festivals, and uh, and of course more developed campaigns like brand campaigns and that kind of thing. So uh, everything that will uh, allow the brand. Uh, to connect with their audience and uh, of course while they're experiencing this uh, very emotional high intensity emotional uh, experience uh, they'll be more open to the brand of course uh, quick one for me it's about authenticity you don't ask to a vegetarian to do the promotion of a fast food brand um, so how do you match this value you know, it's easy. You have a lot of talents who love pets. Well, you could do an association with that and they would be talking meaningfully. Um, we did recently a campaign with um, national, for National Geographic. And they were launching a, a new TV series called One Strange Rock. It's about planet Earth, the scene from far. And interestingly, the, the audience National Geographic wanted to reach was a certain type of uh, audience. And the best audience was the one represented by Zed you know, the DJ, and Zed, um, Zed met with astronauts. He has met with a lot of people who, who can talk the best about this one strange rock. And after meeting all these people, he composed a song. And this song then is the song you could see when you watch a TV series. And then we did a music video recorded where, you know, you should see it, it's a brilliant music video. But anyway, it's very relevant. It was an authentic relationship. He came up with a concept called Love Letter to Earth, hashtag Love Letter to Earth. And then it became a beautiful story because he speaks about something that matters to him. And the brand as well find this very relevant because it's meaningful. Um, so there's a couple of things I wanted to touch on um, that kind of builds on what some of the people have been saying. It's like a really great question and it's a really important question. It seems really pertinent to a lot of the people in the audience today. But definitely riffing off this idea of authenticity. Um, you know, this is definitely the space that brands want to play in. Like, the most important thing for them is being credible and having legitimacy to speak in a, in, in a cultural space. That's how you're going to leverage kind of what the affinity that you need from that audience that you're trying to reach. But I think for artists at all levels, there are brand relationships and brand partnerships and brand fits that are right. This is a very, like, intricate, complex space. There are no one-size-fits-all rules. And um, there's a brand kind of for every artist and every audience at every size, if that kind of makes sense. Um, and I think... What we're also seeing is that brands are becoming increasingly more sophisticated in the way that they think about like breaking artists and new. 
Um, there's one side point I want to make here, though. New is not the same as niche. There are a lot of brands that be happy to work with quite new artists and, in fact, see that as a really important part in their journey as a brand. Like, the idea that you were there at the inception of someone's career is um, quite an important thing for a lot of brands. It's a lot of stuff that we did with um, Valentine's True Music, with an Africa campaign that's finishing in two weeks. We worked with solely um, local artists, that, and a lot of them were new, giving them a platform. Similarly, with things like Deezer Next and Spotify Rise, you can see that brands are really kind of wanting to focus, put themselves at the focus focus point of that of that breaking point and sort of be the ones to tell that story with them but I think the other thing is about uh, niche um, kind of niche arrangements and niche partnerships it's not always about scale and brands that are not used to speaking in this space so I mean Adidas has got kind of natural cultural like relevancy they don't have to work that hard to feel like you know legitimate in that space people get it we've worked with them before they get it it's kind of a seamless partnership and it works and it's integrated but for brands that are kind of stepping into this space for sort of the first time they need to have a much more longer term strategy and they can't just go for reach and go for a kind of big artist early on because it's just not going to feel kind of right so I think for artists that are thinking about which brands can I work with at earlier parts of my career, concentrate on your audience, that's the most important thing in your craft, but also concentrate on, on looking for brands that are willing to take risks and willing to do smaller activations, like Carhartt does some really brilliant things supporting really kind of small niche underground movements in, in London in particular. Um, and it's really not about scale and it's really not about size, but they're really kind of uh, you know credible and, and, and useful activations, I'd say, for all parties at that stage of an artist's career. You know, she, uh, and she makes a good point. I mean, like, you, you literally could be an emerging band. Like, I, we were talking about back there a few years ago, um, you know, bands like, you know, Lumineers were broken. If you everybody here knew Lumineers, they were broke on a commercial. Uh, Ex Ambassadors uh, wrote a song for Cheap, and it broke and made them big. You know, Capital Cities, a bunch of other bands have broken from commercials, and they were emerging bands. Not necessarily did the Lumineers have anything happening yet. Uh, or Imagine Dragons that much, you know, when they, Imagine Dragons also broke on a commercial. So these are all important things to know that even though you're an upcoming band, an artist, um, and you may not have the reach of some of these other larger artists, your song might be a great fit. Um, but I'd love to also talk about how we decide, you know, um, you know, with brands, um, I want to talk about brands and why they're getting into the space mostly, and or or and I get I understand new brands and why they're getting in because they want to get the visibility. But what about uh, legacy brands like Coke, like Bacardi that you talked about, uh, Taco Bell, who already have that fan loyalty and are already huge? Uh, why are they still coming into the space and looking with uh, looking to work with artists? Can I jump in. Yeah. Um, or uh, where do I start? Part? There's a guy called Simon Sanek who wrote a book, Start With A Why. And what he's saying is that he's saying a lot of brands should be more focused on communicating on what, why they're selling instead of what they're selling. And he's using the example of Apple, who is selling computers and mobile phone. How do they sell it? Through retailers. And he's saying, but no, really what they're selling is a way of thinking differently and great design. And if you think about it, and I'm going to follow up what you're saying, think Red Bull. Red Bull gives you wings. Coca-Cola, provide happiness. You know, some music, we don't sell streaming. and we, It's about emotions and moments. Everything we do about music, it's about emotion and moments. And that may be strange to some of you, but it's exactly, these brands are exactly where they want to be today. Um, to get the example of Coca-Cola, yes, we just over the last year, we probably have 20 different partnerships with them. They, for Coca-Cola, it's very much their voice in music. It's their voice. Music has always been associated with it. But what I love with them is that the creativity is very different. When we did something with Vamp in Australia, it's about the cans changing colors based on the four members of a band. Or in Middle East, it's about a TV show about discovering new talent called Coke Music. Um, we did, uh, they did um, the bottles with lyrics in uh, Eastern Europe, where you say, uh, I just called to say I love you, and you can exchange that through your mobile app. So it's always different activation based on uh, the local relevance, cultural relevance, very important. And I love that. Yeah, uh, so we, we work a lot with brands on a global scale. You were, I mean, all the companies you and it's always the same thing you have to be smart about it and also because 
in the end, they just want to engage with the audience, with your audience when you are an artist. So you have to be smart about it. And now the playground is so huge. Not only I'm not only talking about on-site activations, meet and greets, or you know this big VR whatever on uh, festivals, but also digital uh, data, uh, all that kind of things now that are uh, really relevant uh, while they engage with the. Uh, an audience uh, who's really receptive because they're connecting to their artist at this precise moment and they engage with uh, depending on where you play either a club or festivals or 60,000 festivals there's no other place where they can connect uh, with everyone at once I mean, I, I think the reason why they've kept their money in for so long and why they'll continue to keep their money in is because they see value in it you know, um, the objectives that they've tried to hit by making that investment or doing that artist tie up, you know, they've certainly gotten their uh, ROI on it, you know, and if they got their return on investment, they're going to continue to do it. Any brand of that scale, like a Taco Bell or a Coke, if they're not going to get their ROI, I think they're just going to pull out because they just don't see the value in it. And there's so many other promoters and so many other artists that would jump at that opportunity. So I think that's the real answer is because they've They've identified what they want to achieve. They've achieved it in the past, and they know that they can achieve it again this year. Um, but also to touch on uh, Matthias's point, I mean, I think that it just gives them an incredible uh, data collection tool, you know, um, not just in terms of an Excel sheet, you know. If you go to a branded sponsored event, and say you're the head of Bacardi, right, in India, and you come to our Bacardi NH7 Weekender Festival, which is a co-owned IP between OML and uh, Bacardi, right? You're walking around the festival, and you've seen all like, you know, 30,000 young people drinking your products, you know, and maybe engaging with it in a way that uh, you're not going to get off of an Excel sheet, you know. So it just allows them this insight that they're not going to find anywhere else, I feel, from an experiential standpoint. I definitely agree with the... Um the experiential point. Um, I think Coca-Cola is a really interesting and quite a complex example in many ways because a brand like that functions very differently in very um, in different territories, especially in the space of in, in the cultural space. Um, when we were doing activations at Boiler Room, we were very careful to carry out research where we could with a bunch of Boiler Room insiders in various territories and kind of assess how they were responding to various brands and the types of activations that we were doing and the level of branding at various events. Um, Coca-Cola wasn't a brand that we worked with um, at Boiler Room, but Coca-Cola is definitely, definitely something that can traditionally give you scale. I think what you were talking about, about this niche, kind of more hyper-local activations by Coke is something really interesting. And I think what we need to start asking ourselves is, what's the long-term play with brands in this space? I mean, I'm glad you brought up ROI, but ROI is a very tricky and complicated subject. Um, and it's it's really important, it's vital. Brands, why would they be giving money if they don't see to be, if they aren't getting ROI? Um, you know, the ultimate ROI is, am I selling more Coke? But there's many different layers involved before you get to that to do with brand affinity, to do with people's love for the brand and lots of other measures that brands are tracking all the time. Um, but yeah, I think Coke, Coke is a really interesting example. It's a heritage brand, it's a, it's a huge brand. And I think how does that brand function as we move you know, more and more to a, into a space where consumers, particularly the ones that we work with um, in, in London are, are incredibly, um, they have incredibly high standards and there's like, you know, you're really going to get called out on Twitter and on, on social media if you kind of put a foot wrong. An example of that recently, again, sorry that all my examples are very London focused, but an example recently with another huge brand that you'd think would have legitimacy in this space was Puma. Um, and Puma put on a, uh, did you see this? this? How rubbish was that? It was, it was really bad. Um, they put on this like... Uh, like a trap house, basically. Basically, and kind of gave everyone burner phones and were like, welcome to being a drug dealer. Like, this is a warehouse in the central London um, and we're Puma and we're cool. And uh, it was coming at a time in London where four months, uh, like 55 young people in London would be killed from knife crime and a lot of it related to drugs. So it was just like kind of the worst like PR move ever and it was called out on social media and it's kind of embarrassing. that. So uh, brands can really mess up as well. You know, it's not that like if a brand is spending money, they're going to hit it every time. Like they can really, there's some serious missteps that can be made. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about, we keep throwing out the word, words ROI. Does, there, does anybody here know what ROI is? How many people don't know what ROI is? It just means return on investment. If that's so, we, what we're talking about. You spend money. What are you expecting to yeah, get? Yeah. What What do you? What does a brand expect back for their in, initial investment? And an initial investment goes from everything. We're going to talk more about ROI, but like uh, it goes from sponsorships of live events and other uh, content, brand content, 
uh, commercials, whatever it is that they're working with, whatever activations that they're doing. It goes from uh, uh, endorsements, it goes to a, a ton of different things. Um, but yeah, the return on investment for the, and, and obviously talking about what a, what a, since there's a lot of artists and people that represent artists here, how, how they're getting a return on investment in artists and other events that they're doing. So why don't we come back to you? Thank you. Uh, oh, right, let me give you two examples, it's easier. Let's start with Dubai Tourism. They wanted to be more relevant outside of Dubai. They wanted to change perception. Uh, they partner with us and Imagine Dragons. Imagine Dragons funder, you know, 650 million views. Uh, when they recorded, we created a lot of pieces of branded content. You see them jumping from an airplane or uh, doing skiing in a shopping mall, yes, in Dubai, etc., etc. But why is interesting? We did qualitative research before and quantitative before and after. And the year after the campaign, if you were exposed to this campaign, you're 22% more likely to visit Dubai, to consider Dubai as a holiday destination. So that could be this kind of KPI. It could be a pure audience media reach uh, KPI. But the last example I'm going to give you is in Cambodia, a brand called Smart, which is a telco. You have to know in Cambodia, 100% piracy, no music, that, you know, legal, etc. And um, we came up with a concept which is Demi Lovato said, well, we launch a petition. If 25,000 people sign this petition, I'm coming to Cambodia and perform. And then it was 100,000. And then Smart came in and said, oh, okay, if, you, if we reach this 25,000, we pay for it. So everyone was going, oh, Smart is so nice. So she came, she performed, and then we had Jesse J doing it again. Repetition, very important, you said that. Not only doing it once. And to cut a story short, Smart is now the number one Facebook brand in Cambodia. And you promoted a concert for us. <laughs> exactly. That's very true. We did together, actually. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to talk about was best like use cases. Like how we keep talking about the fit and the stuff like that. How do you know when a brand, how does a brand know or how do you know when you're working with brands if they're a good fit and, and with artists? I mean, like, you know, it's it kind of goes all the way around because we're obviously talking about brands, music, branded space. Uh, how do we know when it's a good fit with it, if you work with brands that are looking for artists or looking for opportunities in the space uh, and vice versa. So can you guys give me some examples on that? I, uh, I yeah, I'll, I'll speak about that specifically from an artist management uh, standpoint. <clears throat> so for us, um, we're not really um, interested in doing something that is transactional in nature. We're not really interested in, you know, like uh, now with all this like influencer marketing and stuff, like brands have really uh, woken up to this thing where, oh, I can pay you like a fraction of what an association would usually charge and you can just tweet for me or Facebook post for me and whatever. I, I, I look at those associations as extremely um, shallow and uh, transactional and I don't really think that that's a sustainable way to make money uh, if you're a brand and an artist. The better way to make money is to understand what is the long-term vision of that brand and how committed are they to achieving that vision and can you help them along that path. Um, to touch on an earlier point, I mean, I don't think that it's really like up to the artist to go to the brand and say, hey, I want to work with you. You know, nine times out of 10, the brand is going to go to the artist and say, I like you, you fit my ethos, you know, um, and what uh, what we can do. Um, of course, there are examples in between where management can step in and sort of steer and uh, push them towards the right things. But, you know, for us, like things that really matter for us when we're looking at a brand are, you know, does our audience identify with this brand, number one, you know? Are they really going to, if we start endorsing this brand and pushing this brand to our audience, are they gonna be uh, offended by it? Or are they gonna um, think that we sold out? Or are they gonna say, oh, that's cool, you know? I, I, I like that they've associated with that brand. Um, you know, brands where we've had really good um, feedback is like, you know, Red Bull is a, is a good one. Um, you know, whenever you associate with Red Bull, because Red Bull has also got a different ethos they're more about like empowering the art artist as opposed to like sponsoring or, or all of that so so that's important for us the second thing is that is this a brand that has some international recognition because that is going to help your profile internationally now if i did something for an indian brand you know let's say fruity or whatever you some mango drink that we have in india right like and i come here to france and i tell you guys oh we did something for fruity you guys are gonna be like what 
is that? You know, like it has no bearing. But if I come and I say, that, oh, we did something for Red Bull or Adidas, it has some weight. Now, ultimately, as an artist manager, what you're trying to do is build your artist profile to a point where they become so um, appealing to work with, not just as brands, but also for promoters and festivals and all of that. And I think that associating with international brands will add some weight uh, to your profile. So that's a fairly important uh, one for us. But I'm sure you guys have some other uh, points that you look yeah. for as well. Coming back to what was just said, it's uh, actually the discussion is quite simple. When you go meet your own artist representative and you go and meet with bond directors, bond managers, uh, they have a really simple question. Uh, they have a budget, marketing usually, and they want to know where to spend it the best. Uh, and that's where they have their choices on the table, either as traditional media or, lucky for us, it could be live music. So why would they go into the live music? Uh, again, it's because of the emotion and the connection that only the artist can deliver. Uh, so this is gold. Uh, it's, I mean, all the studies show that it's better than playing video game, than going to sports even, or even streaming music. That's the number one. And only the artist can deliver, deliver it. So um, yeah, that's basically for me, it's about matching the data and the science and the magic. The data and science, we could tell us, because we know how artists are being perceived. Each of our artists, we know what they, some are fun, some are more conservative. If you take Lang Lang, classical artist, he's not going to be the same as um, Ellie Goulding or whatever. Um, so th that's the science. We could tell exactly to a brand this is how the artist is going to influence your brand. That's why he's going to brand enjoyment or whatever. The magic is what the artists really want. Um, I just mentioned Ellie Goulding, let me say. Um, Ellie Goulding was love shoes. Well, and she wanted to be in this play and she became creative director of a um, European shoe manufacturer called uh, Dutchman. She loved that. She designed shoes and all of that, and she promoted it everywhere, and it was a massive success for it, both the brand and the artist. Data meets the magic. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, working with brands and Ellie Goulding and all that, but you don't have to be an Ellie Goulding or Demi Lovato to also approach a brand. So I think that's a very important thing to know that, you know, like, for, for, like I just made out that point earlier today, or earlier a few minutes ago, about how, like, Lumineers, Capital Cities, all those brands, all those bands were not they hadn't even made it yet. And they, and they had approached brands and work with them. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of creativity too. It's not just about having the song, um, that, you know, there's artists that are also working with the brands, like case in point, like, okay, go, okay, go has tur did, never really had a hit and they were getting dropped by their label and they came out with this viral video. And now what they do is they create, they create videos and music for brands. Um, so I think that uh, the best thing that we also uh, talk about is how you guys can approach a brand. Um, and uh, so let's go down that line. Just uh, sorry, I just want just one quick example. I remember we were Singapore Telecom Singtel. We offer um, an artist, and we said, "Well, we would like you to work with Lady Gaga," and they said, "Lady who?" Because she was totally unknown. And today they still think they broke Lady Gaga. Yeah. <laughs> well, let them. Let them. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so yeah, I just had some stuff to add on. Uh, yeah, on how do you know which brand you want to work with if you're an artist? And I think um, one of the other things that we how you can approach them. And have them. Uh, yeah, I think what you were saying before about brands kind of looking for you. I think that's a, a that's a, what you should be hoping. And when that happens you need to have an idea of what your expectations are and what your criteria are. But I think to make it more likely, and this is what I was going to say, is I think it's not just kind of like an isolated artist plus brand relationship anymore. Platform, of course, just mentioned that before, but I think it's also about artists being embedded in a really localised culture that kind of really means something and has a bit of resonance. And I think brands are looking for to embed themselves in culture and, and, in, and in underground culture in some ways, I don't know if that word really means anything anymore, but kind of localise real life cultures in cities around the world in kind of more long term ways. And you're seeing this in a number of things like not only are brands wanting to like put on shows and sponsor events, but they're also lo looking to do a lot more talk based content. There was um, some brilliant series now with um, Adidas, with um, 
Adidas just Adidas themselves in London, um, Boiler Room and Budweiser in yeah. India, and putting on things where artists are, they're more than just their track that's good for sync. They are also like increasingly spokespeople for their communities. They're increasingly people that speak on issues that are important to their audiences. And there's a much deeper connection. And again, that's so much more fruitful for brands when they can get into that space credibly. That's really like really useful if you really want to start changing. If you're a brand, that really wants to start changing public opinion about you and you really want to start building deeper relationships, that's kind of a really important space for you guys to get into, for brands to get into. Um, and another example I was going to give was uh, uh, there's a there's a fashion brand called Coach and they put on a two-day seminar at Victoria and Albert Museum uh, in London and they've invited a bunch of um, female artists of, of all types, including musicians. And it was a really kind of wonderful forward-thinking like discussion, a progressive discussion about representation in the industry. And I think that's obviously also another really important space that I think you're seeing a lot of brands enter that space and trying to speak kind of with legitimacy about uh, potentially complex issues about identity um, and I think that's another space that we haven't really touched on but it's big and not everyone can do it well. Yeah, um, I, just a really quick point. You, even in the examples that you had mentioned earlier about um, Lumineers and Imagine Dragons and all these people um, getting their songs signed, um, there was an intermediary in that relationship. It's not like the band pitched directly to the the brand, you know? Um, somebody had that song, licensed that song to the brand and was the intermediary in that sort of relationship and to build off of uh george's point that she just uh made i i feel that today and um like the digital age that we live in and especially with all the digital uh content that we have going on um you know so you'd mentioned earlier vox id all of these different channels i mean these are all platforms that uh work with brands and will maybe provide an opportunity to a younger uh artist you know and they're not going to go out and do a deal with um, you know, Gaga or Demi Lovato. So I think if you're a young artist, you're a young manager, you know, um, regardless of where you are in the world, um, take a look around, identify who the players are, look at what are the platforms that are accessible to you and what are the platforms that are already doing branded content um, and then see, you know, if there is a conversation to be had there. And, you know, we talked about it earlier with Georgia about how Boiler Room was a like kind of a next step platform. And uh, that's basically where the brands are, I think, trying to go next is, uh, we were talking about credibility, is creating their own platform, their own integrated media. They all have in mind becoming the next Red Bull, like what Red Bull managed to achieve in the action sports, being the most credible media out there uh, in the music. Uh, and that's where uh, they need content anyway. They need content from artists, they need content from labels from live shows uh, and but they want to activate those platforms digitally most of the time and i think that's where they want to push now it all starts with the artist right uh, it needs to be think let, let's simplify it an artist makes money from what um, digital income physical income non-recording income and non-recording income could be live sync brand we need to think this as a whole the story needs to be it's not just okay i'm going to pitch this brand it's, it doesn't work it has to be thought as a plan so it all fits together and the story is um legitimate um i'm gonna open it up how many people have questions okay i'm gonna open it up for questions for a second but just know that um hopefully everything we've given you today will give you some tools to get out there just know as an emerging brand too um and like to his point down there uh, going out and having somebody pitch for you i my my band when we got a huge ford commercial years ago didn't have a publisher we didn't have a sync person we didn't have any of that i had the luck of the draw of 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 of, of running into somebody uh in making that happen it was just me i was a manager and that's all we had and so i've also seen bands go and approach they've hunted down somehow the, the brand or their creative agency gotten whoever it is that they need to send the music to and and get brands and brands aren't just i'm just, we're just not talking about syncing we're talking about endorsement deals sponsorship deals all kinds of other things that you guys, there's so many, there's a 360 degree thing here, what you can get from a brand. Um, but I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you to all the panelists. You guys rocked. Thank you.